Welcome back to our introduction to Buddhism class. It is very good to see everyone. We're just taking a brief moment to make sure all the technological doohickeys and thingamajigs are working. So, all right, it looks like everything is good. So I hope everybody can hear me. I hope, um, I hope we're coming to your, your screens around the country and around the world and finding everyone safe and um, that you're doing really well in the midst of our, all of our ongoing challenges. So this evening, we're going to continue um, our introductory course. And we've covered, uh, this is the third, we've covered the Four Noble Truths. So tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what, uh, what a Buddha is and why the Buddha taught what we now know as the Buddhist teaching, sometimes referred to as Buddhism, probably more accurately described as the Buddha Dharma. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of those word choices in the same way that we talked about uh, dukkha. And as always, if you have any questions as we're going through, um, feel free to put those in the chat. We'll try to keep an eye on those. Um, and also, um, if, if you have some questions or comments, um, feel free to, to chime in. So I do welcome um, this being more than just a one-way exchange. So I want to make sure that people are, are getting something out of this and that the information is understandable. So we started this series talking about dukkha. And one of the reasons I started there, it's probably one of the more misunderstood ideas in um, Buddhist teaching. And probably not misunderstood in Buddhist teaching. Maybe the better way to say that is in translation. So a lot of books in English or non-Asian um, non languages often create confusion around this term. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and a lot of it I think has to, goes back to how Buddhism was initially rendered in English, especially, and um, the people involved in, in rendering that. So just very briefly, uh, a lot of the initial texts in about Buddhism in English were written by um, British military officers who were serving in India or those who had come over to India as part of the British occupation. And many of them brought with them um, very specific ideas of um, the Church of England and understood or translated Buddhist ideas through that lens. So you'll see a lot of early translations of the sutras. Um, it really sounds like King James version of the Bible. So we, uh, to some degree, still suffer in terms of our English translations and understandings from that perspective. So it's good just to keep that in mind and to make sure that we know uh, if we see that kind of thou shalt not type language. Um, <clears throat> those are those are some older translations that have come down. So just to recap, we I had talked about uh, dukkha, and I think it's helpful to, to review <clears throat> as we get into our discussion tonight about what is a Buddha. So dukkha itself has um, many translations. Maybe I, I should say, um, not so much a translation, but the word dukkha can be applied to many situations or many experiences. So there's not one single thing that is dukkha. So we can apply that word to a broad uh, variety of experiences that humans experience. So it can be applied to pain, 
disappointment, stress, suffering, frustration, um, things not going according to plan, uh, hassle, unease, so if you feel unease, dis-ease, dissatisfaction, anxiety, uh, unsatisfactoriness, something not hitting the spot. So if you've had an experience and you want to have the same experience and the <clears throat> succeeding time, successive times that you have the experience, you feel that it's not as satisfactory as the, the first time, that feeling. Uh, Non-reliability of people, right? So if you've, you, you relied on someone, they let you down, that feeling you have falls into this category of dukkha. Um, the non-reliability of things. So something that you count on <clears throat> to work, uh, it breaks. Or you know, we probably all had our phones not work for us, and um, we we're saying, "Can you hear me? Can you hear me?" Right. So this this uh, feeling, this frustration of when something doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Um, the feeling of being let down. The realization of your limitations or limitations of circumstances. So you go into a certain situation with an expectation and you find that, um, you know, the circumstances are different. So they, things don't work out. Um, the limitations of solutions, right? Someone, you have a problem, someone proposes a solution and it solves some of the things, but not all of the things. So imperfection generally. So all of these things really fall into the category of what is being termed dukkha. Most of the time it's translated just to suffering. And so I think if we take some time to really think about or reflect on this broader concept of dukkha, we recognize that it's something happening uh, every day, all the time. Um, it's happened to all of us. Um, it's, it makes up a lot of our uh, conversation. Um, it's something that we talk about with one another very often. So I think when the Buddha awakened to this idea, this concept, right? When he pinpointed this, um, kind of one term or concept or idea, he was really getting at something that all of us experience. So I think the first thing we under, need to understand is this was a deep insight of the Buddha. It was an insight that applies to all of us. Um, and I think it, it really does apply to, um, it, it's so applicable, it applies to you and I, it applies to our, you know, four-footed friends. So if you, if you have a little, um, uh, what a fur baby, as they sometimes are called now in the United States, uh, running around your house, you can see when it applies to them, um, it applies to all living beings. And that's a very broad idea. And that's very unique. That's quite different um, in the history of philosophy and religion. So that's the starting point. This is the, the Buddha's deep insight. And its applicability to all people is also a component of this conversation that we're gonna to have tonight about what is a Buddha? Because that applicability, that broad, um, you know, how broad the concept is, really gets at the compassion that's underlying all of the Buddha's teaching. So when we um, describe this idea, the idea that it's so applicable, the Buddha's teaching is saying, this concept of dukkha really sums up, maybe we could say the problematic aspects of life. Um, it's mental, physical pains. Um, some of them are obvious, some of them are more subtle. Um, some of them are painful, some are stressful. So all of these things together, this, this bundle of experiences is what the Buddhist teaching is focused on. And this is important because all of the teachings in, um, you know, that fall within the Buddhist world, 
relate back to these concepts. So you can you can kind of draw a line back to this concept and then you know draw a line back out to other concepts. So the, of course there's a whole host of ideas that aren't discussed within um, the Buddhist teaching because it isn't directly applicable to fixing the problem. So you could really say the Buddhist teaching is about identifying a problem and fixing it. Um, and for many of us, this problem of dukkha isn't, um, maybe wasn't immediately on the forefront of you know, what we thought religious teaching should be getting at. But um, I think if we think about it more deeply, uh, let's say we sit, we ask the question, why are we here, right? As, as human beings, why are we, why are we alive? Why are we on earth? I think if you back up and ask, why are we even asking that question? The reason is dukkha, right? Why would you even ask the question why you're here? There's some sense of dissatisfaction that has led you to that question. So for example, if you're in the middle of a resort, right? You're on a, the best vacation of your life. Um, you've brought all of your friends, your family paid for the trip. Um, you know, it's free to you. Everyone's having a great time. You're sitting around and, you know, a wonderful meal at the end of the first day. Everyone's excited about everything that you're going to do in the resort. And you say, why are we here? Um, you probably won't say that because you're having a great time, right? You haven't experienced any dissatisfaction. Um, but if you say that at the moment, you may cause displeasure. You may cause bewilderment or ang animosity. So one of the key features of the Buddhist teaching is being receptive, being ready for the teaching. So that receptivity, um, that readiness is probably just as important as the teaching. So as we go through uh, looking at different aspects of the teaching, one thing to keep in mind is when someone asks a question of the Buddha and the Buddha provides an answer, he is already ascertain whether this person is ready for the answer or if not the answer given is one that is understandable by that person so by extension when we dive into the sutra when we look into the teaching we have to ask some questions about what we're reading um, you know, who's asking the question what is the level of the person asking the question what is their circumstance is their circumstance the same as ours? Um, and so in many ways, we it helps to know those surrounding facts so that we have a better understanding of the teaching. Otherwise, if we read you know, broadly, I think in fact, um, it can be confusing because there's no shortage of Buddhist texts and it might actually uh, make us a little bit discouraged, okay? Either you know, we're not understanding what we're reading or we don't think it's applicable to our, our current life um, or a whole host of other conclusions. So again, we're limited a little bit by translation. So if you're reading text in English, you're looking for, um, you know, where's the starting point? So the starting point actually um, is to look at those questions that were asked by lay people. So a lot of the questions in the sutras were asked by monks and nuns. So they've already kind of renounced the home life and probably um, their life looks different than, than your life. So the starting point in that case are the Buddhist instructions on Shila or giving, uh, the Buddhist instructions on moral virtue, uh, the Buddhist discussion of the pitfalls of chasing fame and fortune and pleasure alone. Right. That doesn't mean that you can't have fame or fortune or pleasure. It means you know you're sort of solely focused on on just these things and the pitfalls that those things bring. Um, we're very lucky, I think. We have tabloids, <laughs> and if you look at the people who are chasing fame and fortune and whatnot, um, tabloids are filled with all of the sadness and uh, hardships that come with that life. So it's a little bit easier for us to see um, oftentimes how that ends up. So 
the discussion of positive benefits in our life coming from moral discipline sounds uh, boring to many people. Um, but most of our time, you know, a lot of people's time is filled with, with uh, drama, right? Their friends are bringing them drama. There's all kinds of life drama. You know, they're desperately on the phone calling a friend for advice because of some latest thing. And these are precisely the kind of things that the Buddha says uh, disturb us that are, you know, underlying or keeping us from happiness. And that one of the ways that we can enjoy true and lasting happiness in life is, um, you know, moral virtue. So the less, uh, the less drama we create, the happier we're going to be. That, of course, isn't going to get you on any reality TV show. Um, but it does lead to meditative calming and deeper insight. So uh, as a background, why is all that important? If your mind isn't already calm, if you don't already have the ability to be receptive to the teaching, me talking about philosophical teachings such as dukkha may actually make you depressed, right? So the question I get often is should someone with depression or some level of mental illness seek out or use Buddhism as a treatment for that mental state? And I think the question is yes and no. Um, I think many aspects of temple experience can be very helpful for people. There's a certain amount of structure. There's a certain amount of um, you know, requirement for virtuous activity. A lot of things that might set us off um, are absent. It's quieter, you know, all these different things. It's scheduled, it's regimented. It's also true that those same things can trigger or exacerbate people's mental conditions. So the question has to be, um, you really have to have a good understanding of your current starting point. The Buddha was very clear. He was very insightful. He would look at people's starting point, what brought them there, um, what was the underlying concern that brought the question out, all of these things, and then would answer based on what was really gonna be beneficial or helpful for them. Um, it was true during the Buddha's time. I think it's even more true now. So we really have to know where we are. What happens instead? So if you go to a temple, what are you more likely to see? The second question I get most often is, you know, um, people come to the temple and you know, why aren't, why isn't everyone meditating? <laughs> um, there's actually a lot of other practices that are recommended or part of what you might find in a temple that are going to help create a more meditative or receptive mind that's receptive and open to this philosophical teaching. Gardening, calligraphy, painting, flower arranging, uh, copying sutras, bowing, pilgrimage. Um, there's a tremendous number of folk, pilgrim, uh, folk traditions that have grown up around temples. And the reason for that is we come, you know, literally we come off the street into this building. We're in seek of this wisdom. And at times it can be jarring. At a lot of times it can be quite um, surprising of what the teaching is telling us. So we have to be ready. We have to get ready for that. We have to prepare ourselves for that information. So um, all of these things have grown up around the teaching, around temples, to prepare us in some way. And if you engage in those things, I think, and I've seen, um, you know, a lot of the underlying struggle, stress, animosity, anxiety, all these different feelings uh, go away. So what do I mean by that? Um, when I was younger, I, like most young men, uh, you know, high school boys, I had a lot of energy. So I practiced martial arts. And, you know, when I was done practicing, I had a different viewpoint. I had a different, my mind was more receptive to ideas. So that's when my teacher would, you know, tell me more about the philosophical things. Um, 
I've seen a lot of people, I, I worked with uh, some veterans who had come back from uh, serving in the Middle East and we did yoga. And many of them um, after that said they could finally sleep or calm down. They didn't feel like they were looking over their shoulder. So I think we have to be very aware of all of the anxieties, stress, pressure, and what it's doing to us. Um, and that there might be things that we need to do before we're ready to get into this philosophical teaching. Otherwise our minds may not be receptive. So this is always, um, you know, the old Zen story, you know, chop wood and carry water. Um, you might be assigned to do work around the temple before you are engaging in deeper practice for this reason, is to get you ready. Okay, so now I'm going to assume that you're all ready and we'll go a little bit into um, the specific topic for tonight. So the um, Buddha's teaching is referred to in Pali as the Dhamma or in Sanskrit as the Dharma. And this term also refers to the basis of his teaching. So the Dharma refers not only to the, you know, the book or the, the teaching itself, but what the teaching is getting at. And the teaching, the Dharma is getting at the true nature of reality. And it's the true nature of reality that was understood or experienced by the Buddha. So this was an, a direct experience that the Buddha had and that he's then trying to communicate to us. It's what he awoke to. It's his, uh, it's the um, aha of the aha moment, right? It's the thing that you, you have the aha about. So it refers specifically to what he taught as a result of this insight. And what he was teaching was a path of practice that culminates in Nirvana. And so it's important to realize that this is a path and is leading to something. It's not just a bunch of things for you to do. It's trying to guide you. It's trying to, in many ways, it's like a, a very detailed roadmap. Um, it's going to describe all the wayside attractions and everything you might encounter along the way. Not all of that will be relevant to you. So we, it is uh, incumbent upon us to um, determine where's our starting point and how we get onto the path and then recognize the obstacles and how to avoid them. Um, so sometimes this word Dharma is written with a capital letter D. And when it is, when you see that in the capital, capital letter D Dharma, it's referring to um, you know, this greater truth of how the Buddha sees things. You may also see it written with a lowercase d. So these are, you know, if you're reading it in translation, the lowercase d dharma <clears throat> distinguishes sort of the basic pattern of things that we encounter, that we experience. So you might say um, the dharma of, you know, American life or the dharma of, you know, university life or the dharma of studying and passing the SAT so you can get to college. You know, there's a, there's a whole world of things and rules that exist in that lowercase d dharma, right? These are all the, the way things exist. So as living beings, we need to know both. We need to have clearly understand what's going on with us now. We need to also clearly understand eventually what it is that Buddha was teaching. So the Buddha will often, the sutras refer to both of these things. And for our purposes, they're distinguished in translation by capital letter and lowercase letter. Um, so why do I say that? The, the, the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha's teaching starts off with the Four Noble Truths. Um, and we reviewed those in the first two classes, but um, you know, the Buddha's spiritual insight into what aspects of life sort of explain or exemplify or highlight dukkha. And I talked again at the beginning, all the things that fall into this basket of understanding that is dukkha. Then what are the causes of dukkha, right? What leads to these feelings? Um, and then the Buddha saying, there truly isn't a way to end this experience, this, this unpleasurable experience, 
And then he set, goes forward to set out the path for explaining that. So tonight we're going to talk about what is a Buddha, because this is the path you're trying to get to. And it's helpful to talk about what the goal is so you know whether or not you want to get on the path. Um, makes sense, right? Someone tells you we're going to go to an amusement park. You want to know what rides there are and uh, you know what, what kind of food they have before you decide to drive there. So um, what is it that um, gets you, you know, what is it to be a Buddha? Um, this is also going to be something it, that transcends our experience. So we have to often describe it in terms of what it is not. So um, it is different from what we experience. So we have to exp often explain it in, in terms that are quite different. It's not something that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, in, I guess to start with the etymology of the word, um, the word Buddha is a title. Um, sometimes in Sanskrit, it's referred to as a bujati, meaning someone who is awakened, um, fully awakened, a wise or learned person sometimes. Um, someone who has achieved the perfect knowledge of the truth and through that knowledge liberated from existence before. So everything that came before in their lives, everything that came before their experience in their past life, they have sort of kind of made a fresh start. There's a, a clean break at that point. Um, specifically, the word Buddha is referred referring to uh, Shakyamuni, the sage of the Sakya clan who lived in India, um, you know, whose father and mother were king and queen, and who died roughly at the age of 80 after teaching for over 40 years, um, you know, and being an ascetic. So the question is, if a Buddha is someone who's awakened, what are they awakened to? And the short answer is they're awakened to the true nature of reality. But again, here's one of those difficulties when we don't know what the true nature of reality is, it's not something that we can see. So what is it that they're awakened to? So we do have an answer. This answer I think is helpful. Um, and it comes from the Nikayas. So the, the earliest uh, writings, um, the rec earliest re records of what the Buddha taught. It says, whether the Buddhas arise in the world or not, there persists the law, that stable principle of the Dhamma, that fixed nature of the Dhamma. All conditioned things are impermanent. A Buddha awakens to this and realizes it, and then he explains it and teaches it. All things are not self. So, this passage is really important because Buddhism is very unique because it says that the founder of this path achieved enlightenment. And then he taught the path by which you can also achieve enlightenment. So you can become equal. It's the, the great democratic um, religious path, right? The, the insight of the founder is as equally open to you and I as it was to him. There's nothing that distinguishes him fundamentally from us. He's just gone further. So um, I often say this is like a university. Um, you can take any classes you want. Your progress is dependent on your study. You can achieve a PhD and become president of the university in the same way as the president of the university did. So this is a very unique um, sort of spiritual teaching in that way. It's not a limitation. It's not a, um, there's something so special about the founder or um, this one entity or being, and the path is just to um, respect or worship them or show gratitude to them. Uh, in fact, it is to become them. To, to do the same thing that they did. So to literally follow in their footsteps. So 
what is a Buddha? It's someone who's awakened to the true nature of reality and that true nature of reality. And that means the reality here and now that we experience, that all conditioned things are impermanent. And here's again, it's a good thought ex experiment. Can we find something that is not, um, can we find something that's permanent? Is there anything in our world that is lasts forever, never breaks, never changes, um, and is forever existent? And it's helpful to actually give that thought because many things that we think um, have always been there, will always be there, um, actually won't always be there. And here's another piece where it's helpful, again, as I said, for the mind to be calm and receptive to this idea. So this is not, um, this can be a difficult concept. Um, loss, grief, um, change are all things that cause us stress, are all things that make us sad. Um, you know, no one no one wakes up in the morning and goes outside and says, oh, great, it's so good, my car fell apart overnight, or now it's broken. Um, these, are, these are generally stressors. So talking about them um, requires us to be in a certain frame of mind, just have a certain amount of readiness. Um, but this is what the Buddha awakens to. It's also important here in the Nikayas, it says, um, whether Buddhas arise in the world or not, there persists that law. So this is not something the Buddha invented. It's something he recognized. It's something he awoken to. It's like, oh, this is actually the way things are. Ah, this is, this is it. Um, and so whether, um, you know, it was the Buddha Shakyamuni or, you know, it'll be the next Buddha, it's something that is persistent. We could say it's a natural law of the universe. It just needed to be discovered and then explained, but it's so different from our experience. Uh, it often, and we're stubborn by the way. So it often takes us a little bit of time to, to grasp it. So um, these are principles, right? It's not a dogma. It's not a um, divinely inspired message. It's something that, um, you know, was recognized and the Buddha out of compassion further recognize certain practices to help us realize it as well. So it's a set of practices to develop understanding, um, understanding of suffering, how to overcome that suffering so that we have happiness and how we develop happiness, right? And how we build our happiness so that we avoid imposing suffering on others. And by extension, then we impart happiness to others. So if we, if we maybe, um, again, if, if it's up to, to Buddhists, we would sell or advertise Buddhism this way. Right? It's a path to happiness. It's a path to giving happiness to others. Um, it's just that the most of the things that we think will bring us happiness, um, the Buddha said, actually, we're incorrect about. And I think the situation today is more difficult than it was in the past. So here's my example. Um, I can't see most of you, but you know, psychologically raise your hand if this is true. You probably heard a commercial today. I'm just going to guess, either on TV, radio, billboard, um, you know, on the side of a bus, you saw some advertisement. The advertisement may actually be inside your own home. It might be on your desk in front of you, you know, some packaging that um, something was delivered in may have another advertisement. So all of these advertisements are promising to make some part of your life better, easier, more pleasurable, um, or some product is being told to you that this one is better than the old one, right? The, the, all the ones that came before were not as good as this one, and therefore you need it. Um, I always have to laugh because there are definitely products that sometimes make life 
easier or save us time. But there will always be, you know, next season or whenever the, the new version comes out, um, you have to wonder, was the old one really bad? Is it worn out? Is it used up? Does it need to be replaced? Or have I, um, you know, bought into this marketing? So for us, it's a little bit easier to reflect on. We actually have more um, opportunities to see this in action. That also makes it more difficult because there's so many more things that we are programmed to want that it's hard to disentangle ourselves from all the wanting. Um, and given all the different corners of the internet, there's all the new things that we never knew we wanted and we discover we want. And then there's more and more wanting. So the question is, do those things actually bring us happiness? Now, this doesn't mean that you don't have anything. It just means, can we take ourselves out of this dynamic of constantly being told we need something to make us happy? Um, given that you know we're in the middle of a pandemic, I think it's a really great opportunity to reflect on this. This year probably has seen us shop less, acquire less things. Um, you know, we've gone fewer places. We've not gone to as many restaurants. Uh, for many of us, our life has been, you know, quite disrupted. So has our total happiness increased or decreased? Has it been that bad? Um, I think we've all experienced dukkha, you know, disappointment, but it's actually an opportunity, I think, to focus on those things that are more eternal and um, longer lasting in terms of our true happiness. Okay, so we're on the path to happiness. So we've seen that the Buddha is teaching this path. He's given us the Four Noble Truths. He's told us, um, you know, our reliance on things that don't last our expectation that things that don't last, us thinking that they will last, causes us more, more of this dukkha. It compounds the, the problem. So we might wonder, well, was he the only person that woke up to this? Are there other Buddhas? Um, and so the answer is yes. Uh, depending on the tradition, uh, the Buddhist tradition, there are multiple former Buddhas. Um, so I'm going to highlight tonight one of the most famous prior Buddhas. And this one, um, Dipankara, is famous because this Buddha gave Shakyamuni his prediction of enlightenment. So all Buddhas, when they become uh, famous Buddhas, right? I'm sure there's, there's many people who achieved enlightenment in, in secret and, you know, we didn't have the ability to, to, to you know, uh, for them to travel around and, and be as well known. But when there's an actual uh, Buddha of an era, meaning um, the teaching has died out. So it is time for uh, a new Buddha to appear in the world to reannounce the teaching. So died out either because of, you know, changes in the world or, um, you know, migration patterns or people forgot. Uh, so Buddhist history says that there were numerous prior Buddhas. So I'll share my screen and I'll tell you the story of Dipankara. So here is a Gandharan uh, sculpture, uh, relief carving of the Buddha Dipankara. So you can see um, the standing figure here is the prior Buddha Dipankara. So several Buddhas before Shakyamuni. And then you see this figure, um, these other figures around. Um, this is Shakyamuni. So this is Shakyamuni in a past life when he was Mega, the ascetic. And he appears several times in the teaching. So the, the Buddha actually, after his enlightenment, um, discussed this past life. So this is him uh, offering his hair for Dipankara to walk on. So Dipankara was walking and came to a mud puddle and out of uh, tremendous gratitude for the teaching, um, 
Shakyamuni in a former life laid down his hair so that Dipankara could walk without getting his feet muddy. Um, and then here is also Shakyamuni in a past life offering lotus flowers to Dipankara. And there's other versions here. And there's one where um, it looks like he's flying, but it's Dipankara, or excuse me, Shakyamuni uh, making offerings, bowing to Dipankara. So this is a very, um, this, this image shows up a lot in the uh, Gandharan, uh, what is now Afghanistan, Kandahar um, Buddhist carvings. And you can also notice that that style had a more Western uh, style of carving. So it was very much influenced by Greek, uh, Greek style of uh, carving. Very interesting period of Buddhist history. But so this is Dipankara. Um, so the story is, is sort of critical to the, the background history and the idea that um, from time to time, different Buddhas arise. So Dipankara tells Shakyamuni, um, you know, you will be a, a Buddha in the future and your name will be Shakyamuni. And Shakyamuni likewise um, is the Buddha of our time and Maitreya is the Buddha of the future. So at some point, um, the world will get so tough that we will have forgotten the teaching and it will be necessary for a new Buddha to arise. Okay. So thanks to the British Museum for that uh, the carving there. So Buddha meaning literally awakened one or enlightened one. Um, is, this is someone who has ultimate wisdom. Um, the wisdom is limitless and profound, is, is the thinking. Um, it's something that's not known in its complete fullness. It's not known to, um, you know, anyone other than a fully enlightened Buddha. Other levels, bodhisattvas, great practitioners may have varying degrees or percentages of this awareness, but um, only a Buddha has the full kind of fully realized the full capacity of this wisdom. Um, there's a lot of descriptions. Most of the descriptions of this wisdom and how broad it is are actually in the Avatamsaka Sutra. Part of the insight or wisdom of the Buddha is also, or what else, what else distinguishes a Buddha is compassion. So um, not only do they have this great wisdom, but they're also very much aware of people's experience. So they understand and really see that um, our lives toss us around, our lives beat us up, um, our lives, you know, we sometimes get stuck in a the revolving door of, of experiences, mistakes, um, same missteps over and over again. So the the energy to engage our time in this path to achieve enlightenment is a result of someone seeing that very clearly, you know, seeing people are suffering, seeing people are unhappy, seeing people are confused, seeing people are disturbed. This is what motivates a Buddha. Right? So actually, this is a tough job, right? It's a really difficult job. Um, I've actually heard a few people say that they didn't want to, um, and they were Buddhists, but they didn't want to, to practice too hard because they felt that that was, that was too much. And initially I was sort of confused by that. I was like, well, what we're supposed to do, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a very laudable goal to be so compassionate. Um, and then I realized that it was just true honesty, right? They're truly, really honest about um, how they felt. And I think that feeling was based on having really seen suffering, having really seen difficult situations for people and recognizing that at that moment, at least, they didn't feel they had the, the um, capacity to take on that much. So um, I think that was actually a really helpful insight for them. The seeing that situation, then also you give rise to wanting to rescue people Right. You really want to work for the benefit of others. Um, so seeing the situation, uh, you give all your, put all your energy into this path. So this is what it's like to be uh, 
a Buddha. So um, in the Avatamsaka Sutra it says, the Buddha toiled through eons for the sake of living beings, cultivating limitless oceanic great compassion. In order to comply with living beings, he enters birth and death, transforming the multitudes everywhere and causing them to be pure. So in the picture I showed you of uh, Deepankara, uh, the ascetic Mega says, you know, at that point, I will, I've seen the Buddha, I'm going to give all of my energy into practicing so that I too can um, save people in this way. So through many, many lifetimes and tremendous amounts of cultivation, uh, Mega becomes the Buddha of our time, right? All through seeing people's difficulties. So compassion is one, the wisdom is the other. Um, and the Buddha's wisdom is said to be different than the wisdom that we have, or even the wisdom that the gods have. And that's because it is um, unwavering. It isn't, maybe I could say, it's not conditioned by desire. There's no power trip about this wisdom. Um, it also allows a Buddha to see deep into people's hearts and their minds and understand why they're in the situation they're in. So sometimes the Buddha is referred to as, you know, the great physician. So his wisdom and compassion are really focused on um, helping you, helping you restore yourself to your originally true enlightened self. Um, so this goes beyond self-help. This is going into something much deeper. So there's a very keen insight into um, the needs of people and their capacity and being able to tailor their speech, their teaching to exactly what the person needs. Um, as human beings, we have to try different educational, transformational uh, methods because we don't know what's going to work best for someone. So we go through a trial and error. The Buddha is able to see you know, directly from what the person's asking and see into their heart and then tell them, this is the information you need. This is where you are. This is what you can do to help yourself. And it's, it's very clear. Um, they're able to speak in a way that's very gentle, mild, in a way that you know people can really, that really speaks to their heart. So I think from time to time, we might see these attributes in individuals. Um, we may have a time where someone said something and it really spoke to us. We may even say that, right? That really spoke to me. That really changed me. Those words really resonate with me. The Buddha speaks this way all the time. That is, I think, a, a true gift. And then the uh, Buddha has certain spiritual powers. So um, those are actually enumerated. There's a list of, of uh, 10 specific abilities. And I think if we go through those abilities, it might, um, it might give us a little bit of insight into what, what a Buddha is. So, um, Some of the insights of a Buddha transcend what we currently know about the world. So I'll give you an example. So here's a quote from the Avatamsaka Sutra. Now suppose someone were to grind all the earths in a galaxy of a billion world systems into ink powder. So if all of the planets in the Milky Way were ground into ink, then suppose he traveled beyond a thousand worlds to the east and dropped a particle of that ink powder the size of a moat of dust. Then passing through another thousand worlds, he deposited another moat and continued to do this until all the ink supply made from these earths was exhausted. What do you think? Could a mathematician or his students ever finish computing these worlds and know their number? So of course the monk said no. So the Buddha said, if the lands this person has passed through, whether or not he set down a particle of them were all ground into dust, and if each dust moat was equal to an eon, then the time since the Buddha passed into Nirvana would exceed that number by limitless, boundless quadrillions 
of Asem, Asem Kya of Eons. So one of the insights of um, a Buddha is into all of their past lives, um, complete recall of all past lives. And that also gives you an idea of how they conceive of time. So when the Buddha was asked about, um, you know, the age of the universe and these things, there was actually not in language at that time, uh, a large number to give a perfect count. So you'll see oftentimes in the sutras, um, you know, counting, you know, all the grains of sand in a desert, you know, that's how many, you know, billions and trillions and, you know, on and on years and how many world systems there are in space. Um, at the time, this must have sounded quite fantastical. Uh, thanks to modern scientific, you know, research and um, uh, telescopes, we actually know that he was right and that, you know, the world systems go on and on and on and um, there are, are countless um, planets and stars out there in the sky. So it was actually quite, um, quite interesting to see certain aspects of the Buddha's wisdom um, being proven by science. But here are the 10, here are the 10 things that a Buddha can do that we cannot. Um, so they have a wisdom about what is possible and not possible. And so this is a more general um, insight into maybe we could say the laws of physics, um, the laws of nature, right? What is possible and impossible. Um, knowing their own and others' karmic retributions. So seeing, being able to see pinpoint in time, something that we or another person said or did and being able to see clearly how it plays out, right? So maybe the, um, you know, a butterfly flaps its wings in Mongolia, you know, he's setting off a um, cascade of, of uh, reactions. And we would say it's random. Um, the Buddha can actually see or has complete insight into all of those reactions. Um, knowing all of the, the dhyanas, so all the deeper states of meditation, but also the deeper states of mind everything in terms of levels of consciousness that are possible, um, where they lead to, so their liberations, and the ultimate um, samadhis, or the, the, the deepest states of meditative absorption that are possible through those. So some of those are known to us, right? We can meditate and practice meditation and have access to that, but the full depth of that, we do not have complete access to. Um, knowing the capabilities of people, right? So the Buddhas are able to look at a person if they're seeking instruction and know what their capability is, what their faculties are like, understanding if they have a very uh, keen mind um, or if, you know, they need to adjust the teaching a certain way. So you can imagine this is a professor who is able to explain the lesson perfectly to every student, right, individually, and something like that. Um, having insight into how, not just your faculties, but how you understand or how you see things. So if you're seeing something wrong, or right, maybe using my earlier example of the professor, seeing the student struggle and saying, you're struggling because of this, Right. Very, very instantly being able to understand where they're going wrong. Right. You see this a lot of times in the sutras. Someone will ask a question and the answer at the time, they don't realize how, um, how insightful the answer is. And later they realize, ah, right, that answer was exactly what I needed at the time. Um, knowing all of the realms of living beings. So um, the Buddhist teaching shares with Hinduism and some other um, religions, all the different realms or knowledge of those realms. So all of the different realms of hell, of ghosts, of animals, humans, um, kind of what they sometimes refer to as fighting demons or uh, demigods, 
all of the heavenly realms, um, and then of course all of the the Buddha realms, like every place that your consciousness could be, um, a enlightened being, a Buddha has this complete knowledge. Um, likewise, where all of those paths lead. So if you're in one of those realms, so what is the ultimate uh, end goal or where, where do they lead you to, right? So not just seeing them, but actually seeing kind of what, what happens next. Um, one of the additional insights, it's what's called the heavenly eye. So I forget what this is referred to in English, but being literally being able to sort of see what's going on somewhere else, right? Having knowledge of um, what is happening in other, other places. So this is something that is shared with the, um, with the gods. So obviously you see this in, um, you know, religious texts and um, uh, mythology from around the world. You know, they might describe a particular god or heavenly being saying they looked down from heaven and saw a person or they're seeing, you know, someone in a certain area. So that um, spiritual ability to actually see what's happening um, somewhere else. So interestingly, um, U.S. government did research on this. They, they, they termed it remote viewing and, and got results. So it was very interesting. But this is unobstructed, right? It's not limited in any way. So other, you know, places around the world, different cultures have a similar idea, but there may be a limitation to it. Um, another one is knowing their own and others' former lives. So it's complete uh, insight into uh, your past life. So this has actually become very popular for a lot of people. They're, they're curious, you know, um, if they were Cleopatra or something in a past life. <laughs> so um, probably not, we, we weren't all Cleopatra. <laughs> That's the first one, but uh, knowledge of all of our uh, former lives. So this is uh, actually, there's a book of the Buddha's former lives called the Jataka Mala. So he recounts many of his past lives, so the ones that were very um, formative, ones that were very important. So here's something to know, though. I, I, it's actually very fashionable, um, especially in Portland. Sometimes people will go to someone who will do a reading and get at their past lives. So it's not just knowing what you were, who you were, you know, where you lived. It's also knowing the full life of that so that with that comes all of the emotions of loss right so if you were a mother 300 years ago you know you're going to re-experience the joy of your children's births but also um you know the grief of uh, you know loss of parents loved ones things like that so it's, it's full recall of all of those experiences so that requires tremendous spiritual capacity to um, absorb all of that emotional uh, knowledge. So for many of us, it's hard to um, uh, address or absorb that information in our own life, let alone to have countless past lives have that knowledge come. Um, and then the, the tenth one, the tenth uh, power is having cut off, having severed all of our habit energy, all of the energy that would lead to um, a future rebirth. So um, a Buddha is liberated from all of those limitations, but also is free to see through the behavior that would lead to creating more of those, right? So we, we don't see those things very clearly. Um, so people often ask, is Buddhism a philosophy or a religion? So it is a religion. It is a religion because it, it, it meets the definition. Um, it provides us with some answer to the ultimate nature of reality um, and how that applies to human beings. It um, addresses the questions of ultimate good and the ultimate good of human life, the ultimate um, 
path for humanity and lays out a path for achieving that goal. So that's what differentiates it from a philosophy. A lot of philosophies don't have a path or are not focused on achieving an ultimate good for humanity. They may um, attempt to explain um, humans path or our place in the world, but um, it doesn't necessarily lay out a path to, to, to follow. So what's different though, um, Buddhism does not have a creator God. That's not to say that there is not a God or that there is, nothing was created. Um, it's that a creator God is not the focus of um, the Buddhist teaching. The Buddhist teaching does not deny that um, the gods exist or that there are heavenly realms. Um, quite the opposite. There are uh, different parts of the sutras that actually involve the gods engaging the Buddha in conversation um, or different uh, disciples uh, of the Buddha traveling to the heavens and uh, teaching the gods there. So it's just that that is not the um, core purpose. So venerating the gods is not um, the core mission of the Buddhist teaching. That said, you will sometimes see gods venerated in Buddhist temples. That would probably be a good topic for another, another class. Um, so the Buddhist teaching has a philosophical flavor, but um, it does retain also a um, practical application. So that meets the definition of religion. Okay. Well, I've been talking for far too long. So let me ask if there are any questions. This is the take a sip of tea and stall while you think of questions. I have a question, Sensei. Yes. Um, so you mentioned how there is um, a, another, like a grief processing that happens when you become aware of former lives. Yes. Can it also happen as you develop um, more familiarity with your spiritual practice? I get, so maybe I'll, I'll answer that by clarifying. Um, you have full, full recall, but you, you recognize or remember the grief, but it doesn't impact you the same way. Um, so the Buddha wasn't crying and going through anguish but did re remember all this past information. Um, so I, a lot of people have asked me, you know, they're interested in kind of recalling those past lives. And um, the Buddhist teaching is very clear through meditation, you may have um, that recall. You may recall that information. You may have, you may remember a past life and that's fine. But to do so um, prematurely, may not be advisable because um, you, you might be overwhelmed with the information right now. So if it comes about naturally, that's fine. So many people, um, you know, report that information. Other people do not report that information. Um, whether you have the experience or not is not important. It's not a goal of um, our practice right now. It is part of the, the final enlightenment experience. So um, as the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree and achieved enlightenment, that was part of what we could say, what the wisdom that gets downloaded as a, a side effect of attaining enlightenment. So um, it does happen. I think for many of us now, it can be, um, I have talked to people who've gone through and you know, try to go to someone who will help them recall that information and some have very strong emotional responses. So um, we would say, let it happen naturally. But I would say that um, doing so prematurely could, could overwhelm us. Can I ask something as a follow up? Yes. Um, so I've experienced a lot this sort of duality or juxtaposition rather of melancholy and 
I don't know, insightfulness, I guess, at times, periodically. So I'm just wondering if it's related and I just didn't know, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Or is that, is that a phenomenon that has also been reported? Hmm. Um, I'll try to answer. So if I don't, and make sure I'm, I'm understanding your question. Um, so I, I've, you know, heard from people who uh, have recalled past lives and sometimes it's to different degrees. They may have just an image of themselves being in a certain place. Um, or, you know, sometimes we refer in the West to deja vu. So um, they may have a strong impression that they live somewhere or were someplace. Um, I think that all of those things are are quite natural. I mean, I, uh, these are shared across many cultures. So um, that's different from, you know, this complete, um, complete recall, right? So when the, in the Jada Kamala's, um, you know, the, the Buddha is seeing kind of the important thrust of that life, um, what motivated them, you know, how the life end, what was kind of propelling them through that life. And um, some people do have that insight. Others may have, a, you know, bits and pieces of it. Um, does that kind of answer or am I? It's helpful. Okay. Um, but I've also talked to other people who've gone to uh, psychics or um, past life regression kind of thing. And have, some have felt that it was helpful. Uh, others have, have not and have had negative experiences. Um, in fact, the temple I studied at on Khoisan was... Um, would get a lot of referrals from a psychic in Tokyo. And part of that referral was people who had gone, um, this is kind of out there, but they would go to some sort of past life regression and have a bad experience. And so they needed fixing. So they would refer them to the temple. Um, so I, I would say, um, you know, allowing it to unfold naturally is better than um, trying to force the uh, the experience. So, if that's of any use. There are a couple of questions in the chat too. Oh, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, I'll start with the last one. Uh, can Arhats re recall past lives? Uh, I would say yes. The question is uh, a matter of degree. So um, for a fully enlightened Buddha, they are recalling all past lives. Um, for an Arhat, they may have insight into um, a few or um, not as many. So um, the same is going to be true for um, for us. We may enter samadhi, but we don't stay in samadhi. Um, we may experience the the dhyanas, the the higher states of meditation, but um, the dhyanas are also synonymous with the highest levels of the heavens. So there are beings in the dhyana heavens who are always in that state of meditation. They don't have a physical form, so they can stay. They don't have to take breaks for, for tea. Uh, <laughs> so they can stay in that state of meditative absorption. Um, that same state is, you know, for example, available to us in meditation, 
but we have to end the state of Dikana to go and address the needs of the body. Um, we have to eat. We have to you know, put on more clothes when it gets cold, this kind of thing. Um, so the same is going to be true in many ways for the, for our, our huts. Um, they may have some access, and that access may be um, very much uh, instructive for their spiritual practice, but it's not going to be a full um, a full insight. So the other question is about the other um, stages along the paths, like the Pratyekya Buddha. The Pratyekya Buddha is um, there's different ways of, of explaining this concept. Um, in the early days, so during the Buddha's life. So this is really what distinguishes, and I think the answer here is gonna depend on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the answer would depend on what era of literature you're reading and what school of Buddhism you are um, studying. So I'll try to give a, a brief answer here. But during the, um, the Buddhist time, the protective Buddha or someone who uh, practiced on their own would often hear the Buddhist teaching. They already had the good roots and um, had practiced from multiple lifetimes. And they were able to go and meditate and gain insight into the teaching, right? So they didn't need very much help. They didn't need a lot of practice. They may have only been weeks away, right? Hearing the Buddha speak, you know, ah, oh, that's the thing I'm doing wrong. And then they got it. So numerous monks attained enlightenment during the Buddha's uh, lifetime. They had those good roots to, um, to be born during that time. The same is true, you know, in the, the years just after the Buddha's passing. So many people uh, had heard the Buddha talk and it was just a matter of weeks or months or a few years for them to practice and they, they achieved enlightenment. So they all had um, kind of like Mega and Dipankara, they all had the roots to come together at that time to practice. Um, later on, you see, uh, you know, Buddhist teachers saying, that's probably not the right way for people of later ages to practice because in fact, we need more supports. We need more help. Our, uh, our preparation, our roots aren't quite as good. So um, for example, in the Mahayana, we discourage um, this practicing on, on one's own because we're not using, we're not developing compassion. So in the Mahayana, the development of compassion is sort of synonymous with the Buddhist path. So um, this would differentiate uh, many of these sort of um, uh, other pathways that one could take in the Buddhist path, right? And so also it's helpful to understand um, between the Theravada and between the Mahayana, there is um, a difference in emphasis in how to practice. Um, so that's gonna be different too in the, in the school. So the same with the um, Samyak Sambuddha, right? This person has chosen to practice for the benefit of others. So really it's about motivation. The enlightenment is the same. The motivation for the starting point is different. What, um, you know, I guess our answer from a Mahayana school would be to ensure that the path and tools that you're choosing are appropriate for your circumstances. So there's another. Oh, yes. Um, so the question is about the Samyak Sambuddha and there being only one Buddha at a time uh, manifesting. And how does that, um, how do we sort of match that up with 
especially the shingle idea of enlightenment in this very lifetime. Um, so there's a difference between the Buddha of an era and achieving enlightenment. So there can be multiple Buddhas uh, simultaneously. The Buddha of the era is the one that will be announcing and teaching and sort of reviving the, um, the teaching. So they are, um, they will be known, right? It is still possible for other people to achieve enlightenment. Um, so the Buddha of the future will be Maitreya. And for example, in Shingon, the um, founder of Shingon, Kobodaishi, his vow was to remain in eternal meditation until Maitreya's return, at which time he would also return. So from a Shingon perspective, Kobodaishi is enlightened, um, but Maitreya is already set to be um, the Buddha of the future. So Kobodaishi will come back at the same time. I'm sure other um, you know, great enlightened masters and bodhisattvas will be there. They will also achieve enlightenment. Um, but I, I think maybe it's better to understand the difference as um, you know, who, who turns the wheel, who sets this in motion again. And Maitreya is sort of uh, teed up to be the next, um, the next Buddha. I'd say, thankfully, that's, you know, we still remember the teaching and we have it. Um, so we're not at that stage yet. The description of those times are pretty bad. Um, the, the amount of time that Maitreya is here is rather short in comparison to Shakyamuni. So I don't know what, um, you know, what's going to lead to that coming about, but, um, things will have gotten much worse than, than we currently imagine. So. so we can still achieve enlightenment. The Buddhist teaching is still available. Um, so Maitreya comes after it is completely died out and kind of brings it back. So that's the, the difference. Hopefully, these are those are really good questions. They're all sort of, whole class topic. So I hope I apologize for glossing them, but hopefully that's helpful. Is there any Since other? I have a question. Yes. About uh, the Maitreya uh, Buddha you were just talking about. Uh, yes. Um, is it, is it uh, just going to be self-evident when the Buddha arrives or is there a, uh, who, who's authorized to announce that that is, that that Buddha is, has arrived. Does that make sense? Oh yes. Um, th there there will be angels with horns. No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, if I recall, uh, the sutras describe that. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it's only a matter of days that Maitreya will be um, will be here. The, the Buddhist teaching will have completely died out. Um, I don't remember the full description in the sutra. I, I would actually have to go back and read that portion. I haven't um, read that in a long time, but it sounds like um, you know whatever earth is present is in pretty tough shape. So um, uh, I don't I don't think it's the result of of climate change. It sounds more. Um, uh, dire of a situation. Maybe the sun is dying out or something along those lines. So it's, it's pretty, pretty difficult. Um, but in fact, this is a good, this is a good assignment. I will, I will research and I have not read that um, part of the sutras for a while. Another question, uh, oh, how do we, um, how do we work on our, our ability to become Buddhas? Um, it's through practice. Um, you know, I tell people no matter what school of Buddhism is near them, some practice is better than no practice. 
Um, we are always trying to plant good roots so that we have the ability to come back in contact with the teaching. I, in fact, just had a conversation with someone uh, earlier today, and um, we were we were laughing, lamenting, you know, people who who claim to have been, some, you know, realized masters in the past. Um, I don't think that's that kind of speculation is helpful, but I do think it's highly likely that um, you know if we are studying the teaching now, we probably had contact with the teaching in the past, right? There is some past life connection to the Buddhist teaching, which brings us back to the teaching again. Um, that's what sort of fueling our interest. So I think the reality looking at um, uh, you know, Deepankara's life and, and, and the former, you know, Shakyamuni before he was the Buddha is, um, you know, this, this thing is difficult to achieve. So we're constantly planting seeds and hope that they ripen. And we're constantly working on ourselves. And, you know, the more time we can put into it, like anything, the more successful we'll be. But um, I do think one downside for modern life is we're very busy. Um, we do have more leisure time that we can give to our study and practice, but in many ways things are more complex. But I do think um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Right? We have we have time, but not always the the interest because there's so many things competing for our interest. On the other hand, um, one of the um, you know benefits of something like mantra practice is it's a little bit more accessible, right? You can recite the mantra, recite the mantra, and um, you're planting the seed, you know, more deeply. Um, for me, you know, my first encounter with the Buddhist teaching, I actually, re well, not first, but first in practice, I was in Asia, I was walking around the streets of, of Beijing. Um, it was a long time ago now. And I actually heard a recording of um, Kanon's mantra. And there was something about the tune that seemed just really, really familiar. And I couldn't get it out of my, uh, out of my mind. I kept finding myself um, humming it and you know wondering about it. And it was really in passing. I passed by a small shop that was selling Buddhist imagery and, and incense and things. Um, and I kept noticing it as I was in the area. And that ended up being um, the thing that led to my me meeting my first teacher. So um, I sometimes reflect on that and think, well, you know, why was that tune so familiar? Um, and I think it was, you know, much the same that there was some um, some connection, right? There was some seed that was planted and, um, you know, the conditions were right for it to sprout at that time versus um, maybe not before. Uh, how do you find the time to practice? I can only speak for myself. Um, when I was younger, I had a, had a thousand hobbies. I gave them up. So I had more time. Um, I also, at around 16, decided to sleep less. I heard some statistic that if you sleep four to six hours and you get like 20 to 30 hour, 30 more years of life. And I thought that was worthwhile. So I sleep less. Um, I'm not suggesting everyone sleep less, but um, I do think we, we can look at how we spend our time and decide if it's 
um, a good use of time or not. So, but again, that's uh, that really has to match your life and everything that you might need to accomplish. And certain things need doing, we might still need to do them. So I'm not suggesting you ignore your responsibilities, but um, we might have to look at what our responsibilities are, what our goals and, and priorities are and change. Of course, this is, um, you know, even during the Buddhist time, maximizing our time and efficiency was part of um, ordination. So those who are able to give, you know, 100% of your life to it are able to um, spend more time. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be more successful, but, um, you know, again, any practice is better than no practice. So. And yes, one of the comments is even practicing good deeds. Yes, you'd be surprised how much change comes as a result of practicing kindness rigorously on a regular basis, practicing giving. Um, even for me, um, I practiced and then I became assistant minister of the temple and I was not practicing for myself. I was constantly giving, giving, giving to the members, um, you know, being on call, literally phone on 24 hours for people to call and called out to the hospitals. And my perception or idea of practice changed because it wasn't, you know, just me doing meditation. I was doing prayers and, and practice on behalf of other people. So that really changed um, my practice, my outlook. So the idea of giving the idea of generosity really evolved my understanding of it. Okay, well, I've had you all captive for quite a while. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we will have, this was the third class, we will have the fourth coming up in two weeks. So, if you have ideas um, or specific questions you'd like us to see us review, I'm happy. Um, please feel free to email or message us um, and we will do our best to um, integrate those discussions. So thank you everyone for joining us. I hope everyone is doing well, just like I said in the beginning. Please do stay safe. Um, you know, one good thing about uh, practice is, um, you know, hopefully it keeps us safer, makes us a little bit more aware. So, um, like I said before, wearing a mask is compassion. Uh, washing our hands and cleaning is compassion, right? So we can, we can stay safe and follow the guidelines and make it in the spiritual practice on foot. So uh, thank you, everybody. Your presence here makes this possible. And I hope to see you all again very soon. So have a good night.